Schönen guten Abend. Willkommen im Wien Museum. Mein Name ist Marti Bunzel. Ich bin der designierte Direktor des Wien Museums und es macht mir große, große Freude, Sie alle hier im Namen von Wolfgang Koos, unserem Direktor, und mir selber zu begrüßen. Es ist ein, ein wunderbarer Abend. Es ist nicht oft, dass man einem wirklichen, in der Englisch würde ich sagen, Intellectual Hero begegnet. Sigmund Baumann war wirklich eine, eine Schlüsselfigur für mich als, von Studentenzeiten an. Und äh, ich kann immer noch nicht ganz glauben, dass er hier vor mir sitzt und, und äh, mit uns sprechen wird. Ähm, ich möchte äh, Janine Randieri danken, der Direktorin des äh, Instituts für die Wissenschaft von Menschen, die dieses wunderbare äh, Event möglich gemacht hat. Wir sind wirklich äh, hoch erfreut, zum ersten Mal in dieser Form mit dem IWM zu kooperieren. Sicher nicht das letzte Mal. Und ich werde jetzt das Mikrofon gleich an Sie abtreten. Äh, Sie wird Professor Baumann einführen, begrüßen und äh, dann werden wir den, den, äh, die, den Vortrag haben. Shalini, vielen Dank fürs Kommen. Guten Abend, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren. Ich freue mich sehr, Sie heute Abend im Namen vom EWM, das Institut für die Wissenschaften von Menschen, begrüßen zu dürfen zu Jan Patoczka Vorlesung des Jahres mit Professor Sigmund Baumann. Die Jan Patoczka Gedächtnisvorlesungen wurden 1987 ins Leben gerufen. Der technische Denker, der von 1907 bis 1977 lebte, gilt als einer der bedeutendsten modernen Philosophen Mitteleuropas und war Mitbegründer und Sprecher des Bürgerrechtsbewegung Karte 77. Seine Werke werden seit den 1980er Jahren am Institut für die Wissenschaften von Menschen erforscht und herausgegeben in Kooperation mit dem Patochka Archiv in Prag. Im Zentrum von Patochkas Denken steht die Idee Europas und die Reflexion darüber, was sie heute in einer Zeit, die er als die nacheuropäische Epoche nennt, noch bedeutet. Der Gründer des EWM, der im letzten Jahr verstorbenen Philosoph Christoph Michalski, sah in dem tschechischen Denker und Bürgerrechtler ein Leitbild, einen großen Europäer, in dem sich die unvoreingenommenen Wahrheitssuche des Wissenschaftlers mit der gesellschaftlichen Verantwortung des Intellektuellen unzertrennbar verbanden. Eine Verbindung, die auch in den Geist und die Arbeit des Institutes bis heute prägt, aber auch eine Verbindung, die für das Werk Professor Baumanns gekennzeichnet ist. Die Reihe der Gedächtnisvorlesungen wurden damals von Hans-Georg Gadamer eröffnet und findet in diesem Jahr zum 27. Mal statt. Unter den Rednern finden sich zuletzt Jürgen Osterhammel im Dezember letzten Jahres, Nancy Fraser, Albert Hirschmann, Lord Darendorf, Jacques Derrida, und Martin Wolzer. Es ist mir eine besondere Ehre und Freude, als unseren diesjährigen Redner, Professor Sigmund Baumann, begrüßen zu dürfen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's also a pleasure and a privilege to welcome Professor Sigmund Baumann, not only because it's a premiere for us, Professor Baumann, in two respects. One, it marks the beginning of a fruitful cooperation this evening with the house here with the Wien Museum, whose director, Dr. Kors, and the incoming director, Matti Bünzel, I would like to thank on this occasion uh, for not only housing and hosting us, but cooperating with us. And this is the first event that marks our cooperation. But Professor Baumann, for me, it is a particular pleasure, not only because as a young sociologist, when I came to England, your work was the first that I read but also because for us at the IWM, this is a truly unique opportunity as a premiere. You were our invited guest for the IWM lectures some years ago, which you had to then cancel. We, however, presented your lectures in print. They have now been published by Zorkamp, but it is our first opportunity to host you here in person. This is indeed a privilege. 
If there is a sociologist and a public intellectual who needs no introduction in Europe today, it would be Professor Sigmund Baumann. So this is not by way of an introduction. I'm not going to give you the titles of his book and count his innumerable publications. But I do want to say a few words in a very personal tribute to his life and to his work. As like Mati Bunsel, I have admired him greatly my entire academic uh, career. Professor Sigmund Baumann is perhaps the most important sociologist and the most influential sociologist of his generation and of the 20th century. His life has been marked by some of the events which have marked the catastrophes of the last century. Not only the Second World War and National Socialism from which he fled and uh, was in Soviet uh, Union in, um, as a refugee, uh, but also Stalinism and the anti-Semitic purges all over Europe and the persecution of Jews. Exiled and expelled then in the anti-Semitic purges in Warsaw in 1968, he left to settle in Israel only to leave Israel for the UK as he could not tolerate the violation of the rights of the Palestinians. He taught thereafter at the University of Leeds, and interestingly, I think he's probably the only academic sociologist whose international reputation was made after he retired from the university. I don't know what this says about the university, but it certainly says something about the scholarship of Professor Baumann, who since his retirement almost 30 years ago has produced a book annually. Um, it is a vast scholarship, a scholarship with the most profound influence on not only the discipline of sociology, but on public and intellectual thought. Let me just make two points, which may be by way of introduction to the lecture for tonight. Professor Baumann's work unites in a unique way social history, sociology, theories of modernity, Theories of modernity which are entangled in his work with theories about violence. Modernity and Holocaust, his pathbreaking book in 1989, uh, which was not uncontroversial for many reasons because in a way it could be read as an argument against uh, Germany's uniqueness in uh, being marked by national socialist violence. Modernity and Holocaust showed the fundamental ambivalence of modernity its meaning, but also its madness. And like Adorno and Hannah Arendt, the Holocaust has become for Professor Baumann a pivotal theme in the sociology and philosophy of modernity, which has been a major theme in his work. Modernity with its destructive rationality, which he has analyzed in penetrating and acute detail, but showing also its capacities to efficiently organize in humanity. In such a perspective, Professor Baumann has insisted that the barbarism of modernity is not something which belongs to its past or is not outside of it, but in fact is constitutive of modernity itself. And if that is the case, then this is a danger ever present, which we need to be alert to. In his work, Liquid Modernity, he has used the meta metaphor of fluidity, of, uh, of uh, liquidity to think through the transformations of law, religion, art, science, but also of politics, of power and identity, which we are witness to today. All of these which are precarious and porous. The citizens of what he calls liquid cities have all become displaced persons. A mass of consumers in new temples of capitalism, the shopping malls. All of these displaced persons live no longer, he argues, in a cosmopolis, but in places of fear and of anxiety. No stranger to the terrors of war and the trauma of exile, Professor Baumann is going to speak tonight on diasporic terrorism. He will bring together themes that have characterized not only his biography, but have marked his work in a very, very deep sense, urban anomaly, violence in late capitalism, 
but a life in displacement. Professor Bauman, thank you very, very much for having accepted our invitation to be our guest. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be invited to deliver Jan Patochka <coughs> lecture organized by the Institute of uh, Scientific St Study of Men. Uh, I accept it with uh, uh, humility. I am not, unfortunately, Patoch Patochka a student. Um, but uh, I admire the man, uh, the great thinker and the great personality. So uh, I must in all honesty admit that not in everything I agree uh, with his work, very complex work, still waiting for a uh, able interpreter who can, uh, inter who can explain the relative importance of various elements of his writings. Well, um, I don't agree, for example, uh, he belongs to the uh, widely described by Hannah Arendt generation of 1920s, 1930s, uh, the uh, generation for whom the greatest life experience was the First World War, uh, the tragic event which, shaked, which shook the foundations of European civilization, everything people used to believe uh, before it uh, happened. Um, and uh, he joined, for example, Ernst Jünger uh, in uh, his apotheosis of war as the realm of absolute freedom. I think it is an oxymoron idea of absolute freedom. Um, freedom cannot be absolute. Freedom is a social relation. I am free in as far as I can achieve things to happen which I desire to happen. But that means that among those things which I want to control, there are also other human beings with other desires and I am free in relation to somebody else's unfreedom. Uh, absolute freedom on the, of the front line, according to Ernst Jünger, and uh, in my view wrongly uh, accepted by Jan Patochka, uh, was the idea that uh, all constraints on my freedom to follow, to pursue, what I want to happen are suspended. Among other things, moral constraints. Moral constraints, probably the most important, most powerful of constraints, because you can convince uh, all the courts in the, on the planet that you are innocent, that however, your conscience uh, will be deaf to your argument, and you will still feel that you are guilty. Um, suspension of uh, Ten Commandments, suspension of the uns unspoken demand as uh, the great uh, philosopher, Danish philosopher Knut Lustrup used to say, or <coughs> suspension of absolute responsibility for the well-being of the other, uh, as Emmanuel Levinas used to underline as the foundation of ethics. Now, that is, uh, mm, that means, uh, that, all, that is the only imaginable meaning of absolute freedom. We are condemned, all of us, ladies and gentlemen, you and me in the same way, uh, by the dialectics of, of <coughs> freedom and uh, belonging, freedom, and being a part of society. Uh, we are social beings. We are, uh, exist as humans in as far as we are members of society. Uh, if you remember, when Socrates was given a choice 
to drink uh, poison or to be exiled from Athens. He preferred to drink poison. He couldn't imagine himself existing outside his own society, his own community. Or um, Jan Patochka joined uh, Pierre de Chardin when uh, he actually pointed out that war is the crest of the tide that brings a new beginning, new development um, to, the, to history. Uh, I, however, am uh, all in favor of uh, Jan Patochka uh, development, I very much hope that many of you read his work, so I'm referring simply to it very briefly. Uh, he developed uh, Heraclitus, Heraclitus' statement that uh, uh, about phronesis, about the road to understanding. Uh, Heraclitus pointed out that uh, by nature, of, by its very nature, understanding cannot but be at once common and conflicting. And mutual understanding, mutual agreement, uh, being really interested, concerned with the other and respecting the other, uh, contains both things, both things. Uh, uh, on one thing, sharing common ground, uh, there is no conflict between people completely estranged from each other, not interfering uh, with each other's life. On the other hand, uh, there is a conflict. There is a conflict because it's a meeting of different biographies, different experiences, different uh, uh, elaborated, habitualized, habitualized uh, attitudes towards life, different different Welt anschauungen, so it, there must be a conflict. And uh, I think that two uh, philosophers, on the one hand Hans Maria Gadamer, who spoke about fusion of horizon, of bringing together different cognitive um, views of the world by participating in joint practices, cooperating, cooperating. Uh, which uh, shows the right way to resolution of the issues which I am going to discuss in my lecture today, namely the conflicts arising from the phenomenon of diasporization. And the other philosopher whom I wanted to mention uh, in this context and from which I take, ins take inspiration was well, great Georg Simmel, in my view, the greatest probably sociologist in history. And uh, uh, he defines a stranger, a stranger. He uh, defines stranger as a man who comes today and does not leave tomorrow. Now, that is roughly the description of the situation in diaspora. He was very hopeful, Zimmer, I mean. Uh, he believed that that is actually the sure way with the possibility of leading towards, uh, towards uh, um, mutual understanding, mutual understanding and mutual agreement. Uh, in his book, Der Kampf, uh, he presented conflict as the first step towards uh, coming to understanding each other and elaborating a modus quo vivendi, uh, possibility of living together in peace and to mutual benefit. Well, this is roughly the background of what I am going to say. And uh, uh, the topic of the lecture, as you probably noticed from the title, is a uh, 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 terror of diaspora, terror of diaspora. Terror in double sense. On the one hand, there is a widespread opinion which has some grounds uh, to support it, 
let me the opinion that um, uh, the presence of diasporas, the mixing of culture, the coming of strangers, and uh, leaving them, in, they are living in uh, close proximity around, uh, that, that breeds terrorist phenomena. And we had events recently which seem to um, confirm that um, there were terrorist acts, very bloody acts, um, in Paris, in Copenhagen, they were before them in Norway, they were uh, uh, events in uh, Holland and very many other places. Well, how to explain that? That is the first meaning of the diaspora's terror. The terror which allegedly uh, emerges out of the diasporization, out of this present day situation in which we today live. Um, well, I would uh, put it to your attention, for your consideration, a somewhat different explanation, maybe that uh, uh, two factors uh, create the possibility of terrorist attacks in the environment of diaspora. Uh, one is caused, one factor is our arms trade. I wonder whether you are aware, you probably uh, should be aware and you can be aware if you think about it. There was no time in history where the uh, this planet was so saturated with arms uh, as it is today. It is so terribly easy to get arms in, in uh, our times. Uh, Anton Chekhov, Anton Chekhov, the great, uh, great uh, Russian novelist and short story writer, um, instructed the future writers of uh, theater plays that uh, if they want to represent the reality properly, then if the first, in the first act uh, there is a gun hanging on the wall, it must shoot in the third act, and because of that is exactly how it's happening. Because of the uh, uh, virtually uncontrolled arm trade going on around the world, um, we are living on a sort of a um, minefield. We know that there are mines, we know that there are explosives there, but we don't know where they are and we are aware that at some point, sooner or later, they must explode, but we can pinpoint time or place where it will happen. We are probably doomed to it, providing that we go ahead with the dissemination of mortal weapons. And the other thing, uh, the other factor is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our media business, our media business which create a situation that for a minimal cost, minimal cost, cost of a gun and cost of a few rounds of ammunition, you can commit uh, something of which the whole world in real time will know and watch with tremendous interest. And the media which are guided by uh, their uh, dream of high ratings for their broadcast, know uh, how to use it, know how to use it. One violent act and then several weeks of high ratings because we are all watching repeated, repeated pictures, ever more gory, ever more frightening of the event. Now, if you put these two um, factors together, then uh, what we receive? We receive a situation of a high temptation to follow the uh, 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 initiative of Herostratus. You know, Herostratus entered history, all our children are studying his biography in the school. Why? Because he made a scandal. He destroyed the uh, 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 the sculptures of gods in the alley in Athens. Um, 
to enter history, enter history through that way, through atrocity, um, simply by being a famous criminal. Sometimes, in people who are cast in the situation of uh, uh, members of the diaspora in a foreign country, uh, people who are in the place, but not of the place, which are discriminated, which uh, in 50% uh, like the youth, young uh, comers from Africa to France are uh, unemployed and without prospect of good life, now there is a great temptation to uh, make something which is truly important, which make an echo, to show that you are present. I was here, I did something. Everybody knows my name and, uh, well, recently we had this second pilot in uh, German wing uh, airlines, which was pro who was probably motivated by the same idea. He was very unhappy. Uh, he considered his life unworthy of living and uh, he preferred the very, very uh, widely, widely watched and widely um, recognized uh, murder, because it was murder of 150 people. Now, uh, he preferred that to continue this uh, life without me. So, uh, I don't think that there are ways under present condition of uh, stopping this kind of terrorism. We are taking the risk. We are living, as great Ulrich Beck kept repeating, in a risiko Gesellschaft, and there is no escape of that. That is one of the risks which we have to bear with. Well, the other terror is the terror we feel at the site of diaspora. Why I'm using all the time the term diaspora? Diaspora is a novel phenomenon. Migration is not a novel phenomenon. Uh, uh, throughout history of modernity, there was massive migration of people. Once again, it was a historical product, difficult to avoid. Um, the modern way of life, ladies and gentlemen, whatever other things it contains, is also a factory of redundant people. There are plenty of redundant people continually uh, produced, produced uh, under modern conditions for two reasons. On the one hand, but modernization, modernity as such, um, it means um, compulsive, addictive um, uh, modernization, modernization, and modernization consists in two things. Introducing better order, replacing the old order, which for one reason or another is not working properly, not satisfactory, and the second uh, is doing things which were done yesterday, but which less, at a lesser cost and deploying less labor than before. For these two reasons, order building and what we call economic progress, some people find themselves unfitting, unfitting, not having place in society. Uh, and they are called redundant. Redundant, by the way, is also a novel concept. I don't know whether you remember, 20, 30 years ago, uh, people didn't speak about uh, redundancies, but about kicking people out of work, making them unemployed. Un redundancy replaced the concept of unemployment. Unemployment was a concept that analyzed the um, structure of the world, which underlined this emphasis, which smuggled in, uh, if not emphasizing openly, the idea that the norm of human being is employment. Unemployment, adding this un to employment means that unemployment is abnormality. 
abnormality. The proclaimed purpose of government was to assure full employment for everybody. Uh, it, uh, it was never uh, uh, it was never suggested that some people, for one reason or another, could be good for nothing. There should be no place in society for them. Uh, well, so uh, that's one uh, way of producing redundant uh, uh, people, and the other, as I mentioned already, a better order. Now, changing order means reshuffling people. Some people who were uh, in very important positions are reduced, are relegated uh, to the margins. Some people always, when you introduce new order, whether it is sanitarian order or even a decision made by democratic government, always some people become unfitting. Uh, to be allocated a place in this new order. So there was a migration. I think that uh, uh, many of you probably have uh, great uncles or great grand uncles or great grand aunts or aunts or even great uh, grandfathers who emigrated from Austria uh, to. Um, I don't know, United States of America to Canada, to South America, to Australia. Uh, <clears throat> and I uh, said there simply because modernization here, however weak it was, produced such redundant uh, uh, people. However, there was difference in treatment of such people at that time. They were uh, for one reason or another, there is no time to explain all the uh, uh, issues involved. Um, they were expected, expected to integrate two. To integrate two. To some already assumed totality, cohesive, coherent totality, with its own culture, its own principles and so on. It was called assimilation. Assimilation. Assimilation, uh, we tend to forget it, is a metaphor taken from, bio, from biology. The original meaning of assimilation is that you put into your mouth and your digestive uh, tract, you put foreign objects, which, however, you digest, and therefore you transform them into the cells of your own organism. Now, that was roughly uh, the vision of what we will become with strangers who come to settle in this country. Uh, diasporization is something else. People are migrating for reasons which I just mentioned, looking for bread and drinking water, or better chances of development of their original talents, or simply for their wish to be adventurous, for all, all sorts of reasons, uh, but uh, they are not expected, expecting to be demanded in exchange to surrender, to abandon their own identity. They want to remain themselves. They see no reason why living in another place, paying taxes in a different country, uh, the, the, contributing to a different country, uh, country economy, they should renounce what they were, in fact. A very good example, if you look at Germany, um, Turks who came as uh, guest arbiters uh, um, to uh, Germany, settled there, and they, in very great numbers, probably in great majority, are very loyal members of the uh, uh, German uh, Federation, and, uh, but however, they don't see the reason why should they stop being Turks and abiding their own uh, tradition, their own culture, culture their own uh, um, customs. Um, well, uh, the uh, 
situation is therefore novel. Stranger became a different phenomenon. What is stranger? Well, and we classify people we know as friends or enemies. Friends of enemies, well, are comfortable in the sense that we know what to do with them. We know how to behave towards friends, we know how to behave towards enemies. Stranger is an ambivalent creature. Stranger is somewhere in between. The trouble with stranger is that you don't know how to behave. And it is a frightening situation. It is an element of uncertainty. Element of uncertainty. Well, the strangers now become, uh, to you, they demonstrate because they don't do, uh, any longer are willing to assimilate to. They want to be themselves in a different country. Because of that, they play quite a new role which the old-fashioned migrants did not. How to describe this role? Well, they are nomads, refugees, exiles, all uh, blended into one uh, character, into one character. Nomads, refugees, exiles, who come to, to overlay the sedentary society like ours. And by sedentary society, which I don't mean just people settling in a particular place, geographical place and staying there and not moving around. By sedentary mentality, I mean something more. The, what one would call existential security. Namely, my achievements, life achievements, stay with me. I cannot be suddenly refused the position in society which I earned. I can plan in advance. That is existential stability. What uh, the uh, migrants, however, around us do? What they do, they are harbingers of bad news. They are, I would call it, I would call them walking dystopias. Walking dystopias. They show that the world is on the move, that no one or very many people, including probably myself, um, is uh, not uh, certain of whatever considers he or she as the uh, essential elements, essential features, founding stones of his or her existence in society that all that could be denied. Those people who lived somewhere else, suddenly they were forced to abandon everything and to seek very often without success, employment, uh, dwelling, um, uh, medical service or whatever, education for their children somewhere else. They are in uh, putting terror into our hearts simply because they are reminding us of our own precariousness, of the frailty of our own situation. Uncertainty, ladies and gentlemen, fear of being abandoned, of being excluded, of being deprived of the rights earned in a very honest and very industrious uh, uh, life. Now, this fear, this uh, anxiety, this kind of anxiety is the greatest fear of our time, the uncertainty. We are living in a situation of uncertainty. What are this, uh, the deepest roots of this situation of uncertainty? The deepest roots, obviously, is globalization. 
Globalization mean, means, among other things, that our uh, governments, our institutions which we inherited from our ancestors who created modern democracy, these institutions cannot any longer protect our, our well-being. They cannot deliver on their promise. It is not the question of corruption of politicians. It is not the question of their stupidity. It is not a, a question of their ineptitude. It is the question of them being put into two, into two, uh, under two pressures, which are contradictory. On the one hand, they want to serve their electors. On the other hand, if they really try to do what their electors want to, uh, well, they would be probably inviting catastrophe because uh, other conditions of globalization, some powers, some powers, but powers crucial for the future of each one of you and your children, your grandchildren, unborn great-grandchildren, those uh, powers are not under political control. And that is uh, why uh, quite a few political scientists observe that contemporary political institutions which we have uh, are not good conductors of popular will. They may be well wishing, but they are important. We have, on the one hand, we have powers that are free from political control. On the other hand, we have political institutions which suffer deficit of power. They, can, they won't, they can't. And that is the reason of a situation of uncertainty. We don't know where to turn to. Sometimes you go to the public squares, we stay, we stay there a week or two, uh, we come home, nothing happened. Uh, Wall Street was occupied, everybody knew that it was occupied, apart from people working in wars, on Wall Street. They did notice it. Nothing happened to them. Now, this feeling that, just imagine yourself sitting uh, on an airplane flying up there, far uh, up, and suddenly you realize that uh, uh, all the, the optimistic and joyfully sounding um, information uh, 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 leaking from the um, loudspeakers inside the cabin. Uh, all was re were recorded uh, a lot of time ago, but the pilot cabin is empty. Not only pilot cabin is empty, no one is sitting there, but the uh, airport of um, your destination is still on the drawing boards. There is still a lot of building permission given for it. Well, the being suspended in such a situation where there are no stable, powerful points of reference to which you can uh, refer. Uh, that is roughly the situation of precariousness. Uh, to some extent, I suggest to you, perhaps you would if, uh, disagree with me, if you do, then you are lucky, I admire it. But uh, uh, I think that to some extent all of us belong to this new category of population, which is called precariat. Precariat. The, uh, the major point, of, major feature which distinguishes uh, this category is precisely the frailty, the mm, brittleness, uh, the fragility of the social position. Existential uncertainty. Existential uncertainty. And here are those people going around, clearly foreigners, clearly strangers, clearly not being of this place where you live, who remind you of this precariousness. And that's their and that is the great guilt, which we are unlikely to forgive. Well, that's the situation. Let us be 
clear about, let us face the fact that is what in our subconscious creates this suspiciousness towards people who are coming here. They are embodiment, walking embodiments of our fears. Who knows uh, if that happens to them, it may happen to us. Life would be much more quiet and there will be much fewer nightmares at night if they were not uh, around. But they are around. Uh, well, very nicely describe it um, <coughs> uh, already mentioned Ulrich Beck saying that the different religions are coming into more direct contact. Muslims, Jews, Christians are praying in the same places. In London you can find mosques, churches, um, Catholic churches, evangelical churches, uh, synagogues, um, on the same street in direct vicinity. The explosive force, says uh, Beck, uh, of this simultaneity of geographical proximity, geographical proximity and social distance, is only now becoming tangible when all of their attempts to isolate themselves from each other are already futile. The one and exclusive God of the religious other is no longer elsewhere, far away in distant exotic countries, but is here now, along, alongside us, in our midst. Now, that's a new situation, it is relevant. That's a new situation, and we are only now starting to adjust ourselves to uh, the need to cope, to, to tackle uh, this novel environment. What responses are there to this situation? Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one of them is multiculturalism. Multiculturalism. Uh, multiculturalism, please uh, distinguish between two uh, terms which very often are confused and uh, used interchangeably. One concept is multiculturality and the other is multiculturalism. The difference between them is like the difference between modernity and modernism, or mo postmodernity and postmodernism. Multiculturality is just a statement of fact. We are living, including you, the Viennese people, in a multicultural situation. There are uh, enough to walk uh, the street from your home to your a uh, workplace, if you have a workplace, luckily, um, uh, to meet on the way a number of people of different skin color, different language, different way of behavior, and probably going uh, uh, to, to a temple, not on Sunday, but on Friday or on Saturday. So, you see, uh, that is a fact of our life. We are living now in a multicultural environment as described by Ulrich Beck. Multiculturalism is something else. Multiculturalism is a policy, is ideology. Ideology, which says, for example, that, uh, well, generally speaking, says that every culture, whatever its content, has the right to to, uh, to become permanent, to reproduce itself, just because it is different. Every difference should be preserved and not interfered with. Stanley Fish, the American philologist and literary critic, distinguished two kinds of um, uh, uh, this multiculturalist policy, however, 
on the one hand, he put it this way, there is a uh, 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 boutique multiculturalism, and on the other, there is serious multiculturalism. Boutique? Well, everybody practices it one way or the other. Uh, you like to have variety of uh, uh, culinary pleasures, so you go to different uh, kitchens, different restaurants. Uh, you like uh, uh, to participate even in folk festivals organized under time and again. But keeping your distance, keeping your distance. That's a superficial sort of, uh, of uh, uh, multiculturalism. Uh, which doesn't change anything whatsoever uh, because it, it is a sort of a, um, a, 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 a Pontius Pilatus gesture. You just wash your hands of the fact that people are different and they are, for one reason or another, forced to remain in the same place and somehow meet again and again and again tomorrow, the next month or next year. But you don't want to do anything about it. Nothing. Uh, neither to facilitate the cohabitation, nor to try to convince them that what they are doing is not the only, and certainly not necessarily the uh, best way of doing things, and engage in a serious dialogue with them. Well, the other is strong um, multiculturalism, which leads directly, as Stanley Fish observed, uh, to the conviction, to the postulate that the cannibals should be allowed to eat meat of their choice. Um, well, don't touch, don't interfere. Keep your distance. Keep your distance. Ladies and gentlemen, both kinds of multiculturalism do not lead to solution of the problems which we confront. They just sweep the problems under the carpet. It is the same, uh, it is following the same tendency which is pronounced in contemporary society by the phenomenon of gated communities. Probably you have it in Vienna as well. They are all, all around in Britain, and they are all around in the United States of America. Uh, gated communities, buying yourself, paying uh, above your nose, uh, paying for the dwelling in a surrounded by closed circuit television and armed guards territory, where only people like you and no strangers, no undesirable people are allowed in. That's again, again, a sweeping problems under the carpet. Because the more secure is your gated community, the less you are prepared to deal with the true, real difference which you will find in the street, which you will find in your workplace, and which your children will find uh, in, uh, in the school. Um, the terror of the strangers will, will rise, will multiply simply because living in the walls of gated community, you are losing the skills of dealing with people of different kinds of views, different kinds of ideas. Well, uh, <coughs> It's not just one manifestation of this tendency to sweep problems under the carpet. Um, I, uh, probably all of you are in one way or the other computering people. You are, we are all using computers. We have pocket computers. We sleep with computers. We never leave home without an iPhone. That's all true. Uh, there were hopes attached to introduction of this sudden access to everything which happens in the world, that people will widen their horizons, people will open their eyes. That will be a revolutionary event uh, in history of modern democracy. The practice, however, testified by uh, 
um, sociological research shows the opposite, that great majority of people use the online part of their life for getting the comfort, the convenience of the absence of controversy. If you come across a website which uh, propagates views which you don't like, you just use your finger. You don't have to do, use anything else. You just press one key and that is the end of the story. Uh, the great majority of people who use um, addictively online uh, means of communication um, create what only can be called zones of comfort, artificially cut out from realities of life. Uh, you, they uh, can be described as holes of mirrors. The only sights which you see there are reflections of your own face or uh, echo chambers. The only sounds which you hear are the echoes of your own voice. As if all of us were united and then we switch off your computer and must go to the street and unless you have in your pocket um, your uh, smart telephone in which you can hide from the humdrum noise uh, on the street, you are really in big trouble. So that's the, roughly the uh, uh, strategy, the reply to the new diasporization of our life by cutting for yourself a secure niche, taking your distance, not interfering, not worrying about it, doing nothing about it. Well, these are, I think, uh, so far strategies which I, which I, uh, uh, which I uh, uh, quoted, uh, ineffective, ineffective. They are temporary respite, but in the long run, they are quite harmful for our prospects. But Adam Daniel Rothfeld, acute observers in Poland of meanders of contemporary life, observes recently, I quote from him, suddenly it turns out that much of the public opinion in democratic states which for years have backed the building of common Europe, free of xenophobia, of populism, of extreme nationalism, all that is swayed by primitive demagogy amounting to slogans like France for the French, Finland for the Finns, Netherlands for the Dutch. Until recently, these countries were seen in the opinion of Europeans as icons of tolerance and openness. Now that is the impact, not direct but mediated impact of diasporization. Diasporization leading to the impulse of separation, of keeping out of trouble, and uh, manifesting itself in political postulates which are welcome for every demagogue wanting to gather uh, votes in the next general election. So they are not very hopeful advisors to follow. What is left? Well, left is to engage in dialogue. But what sort of dialogue? Uh, very often, many of us, under the impact of examples coming from television screens, when politicians meet, they don't engage in dialogue. They just pronounce a series of monologues. They, don't, they, they have no intention to achieve, uh, to achieve agreement. They only want their adversaries, advers uh, adversaries to be proved beyond salvation. 
If the uh, adversaries agreed, that would be a very bad sign. Something wrong with me. You know, we, have, we, have, we, 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 we need to show that we cannot be combined into one institution of politics. They will belong to different worlds. So not, not, uh, I, by dialogue, I don't mean um, the features of monologues. What I mean is what Pope Francis did. Pope Francis, when he was elected a pope, uh, he gave an interview, first interview to the press. To whom? There were enormous choice of journalists wishing to do interview with Pope Francis. But he selected uh, Signor Scalfari, the dean of Italian journalism, who is also self-proclaimed atheist. The Pope giving the first interview for the atheist journalists. And uh, the interview was given by Pope Francis um, to be published in La Repubblica, which is one daily in Italy, which is openly anti-clerical. That's the example. That's what is meant by dialogue. Dialogue means being ready to engage in serious debate with people, even such people, who hold to views which you detest and hate. Only that may lead to something, to something, to what? To elaborating in the desirable way the modus vivendi or modus covivendi. Living together, not despite our differences, but thanks to our differences, which are engaged in this constant dialogue. We often mean withdraw from critique. No, on the contrary, but it does involve what um, Richard Sennett, the great uh, living sociologist, one of the greatest, perhaps even the greatest, as some people think, uh, 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 presented in three partite formula, three parts, formula of three parts. The first part, informal, the second open, and the third cooperative. Informal, open, cooperative. What does it mean informal? Informal means you don't start debate with a pre-designed agenda or pre-designed rule, rules of procedure. You leave the rules, you leave the agenda to the dialogue developing. They, uh, it is the best way of coming across the answers to your research, to your search, which will uh, prove to be useful, effective, and gratifying to all involved. Open. Open means that unlike uh, people coming to some university seminars, your intention of coming there is not to prove that you are wise and everybody else is stupid, but uh, you are prepared to play double role of a teacher. You want to bring something interesting, otherwise it would be useless. Your own experience, your own results of thinking, which may be of some use to others. On the other hand, the role of a pupil. You must be prepared that you can be proved being in the wrong. That's a very great risk to take. Not very many of us are ready to do so, to put yourself to this risk. Uh, we are, uh, we like a good self-esteem, we like respect, self-respect and so on, and when you are proved wrong, obviously, it's a very sad moment to survive. But you have to be prepared for that. You have to be prepared. That is the sense of dialogue, that here are people who are not divided between wise and stupid, 
But people who are divided by their different biographies, different experiences, different traditions, a different way of thinking. And finally, the third element. The third element is cooperativeness, cooperativity, if you like. Uh, cooperation is different from uh, other forms of contact by the fact that you are united. You are united by the same purpose. The same purpose, mind you, is nothing less than coming to the truth of the matter. Truth of the matter. If you approach the dialogue with this intention, and you stick to this intention, then what you may get in the end is that there will be no winners and no defeated. Everybody will end up as a winner because everybody will gain something. You will learn from other participants of the dialogue something which you yourself didn't experience or overlooked, uh, didn't come on your own to understanding, but in the course of dialogue you can do it. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not uh, sharing you magic means uh, of making uh, life better and the world or improve the world. I am not suggesting that uh, uh, these propositions are easy to apply. I know how difficult it is. But uh, it's my deep conviction that uh, uh, that is virtually the only uh, way of creating some prospects, some possibilities some possibilities of resolving the problems which you confront and get rid of what I call the diaspora terrors on both sides. If you find a better way, I wish you luck. However, I am able to deliver all of that. Thank you. Vielen, vielen, vielen Dank für diesen wunderbaren Vortrag. Thank you so much for this extraordinary lecture. Um, wir beenden den Abend für heute, aber Professor Baumann ist noch für mehrere Tage in Wien und es gibt noch zwei öffentliche Events, wo es auch Gelegenheit geben wird für Diskussion mit Professor Baumann. Morgen um 19 Uhr im Bruno Kreisky Forum. Da gibt es wieder eine, einen Vortrag, aber auch mit uh, moderiert von uh, Philipp Blom. Der Titel ist Der Fate of Enlightenment in the Era of Diasporization und dann am Freitag um 17 Uhr im Republikanischen Club in Neues Österreich, da gibt es eine Diskussion mit dem Professor Sigmund Baumann, moderiert vom Thomas Wallerberger. Ich möchte mich noch einmal bedanken bei Rektorin Shalini Randiera für diese wunderbare Partnerschaft und ich freue mich, Sie alle bald wieder im Wien Museum begrüßen zu dürfen. Guten Abend.